against a former player or assistant. Snyder, of course, his co-captain, his guard in the late 80s, and an assistant at Duke until a couple of years ago. A lot of emotions for both of those men this afternoon. Quinn Snyder said he didn't know what to do. Wouldn't he hug Krzyzewski, say hello to the Duke players. What would his own players think? It was kind of a tough situation there. Duhon grabs his own miss to Reggie Love. 16 quality minutes for Love, and Duke would take the early lead. But then Kareem Rush would warm up. Hits the three, the Big 12 leading scorer showing no ill effects with the bad wrist. Knocks out another three, a nine zip run to end the half. Snyder's team down only six. It's a four point game in the second half. Arthur Johnson steals it from Williams. Missouri's within two. But then Jason Williams, watch him use the pick here, guys. He just reads it well, hesitates, now watch this move going inside. Batty the defenders. Stokes, yeah. Now, this is what is beautiful. They go to one guy, Williams just shoots the three and makes it. He took 12 threes, made five of them, but Rush would answer. Oh, he's tough. Shot for shot. He was five of eight behind the line. 29 points. Missouri only down one, but then Battier, who played all 40 minutes in a key Duke run, making Ooh. some plays here. The block ahead to Williams. Like that a little shake and bake, a <laughs> little shake and bake. Jason, take it to the rock. You know who else makes some big plays? Oh, Mr. Dunleavy. Battier. Well, Battier will miss the shot. Dunleavy sneaking yeah. inside there for the tip in. Big he basket. has 15 points, nine rebounds. You're right, that was a big basket. He made some big plays in Duke's run to hold off the charge. Nate James on the feed from Williams, who had nine assists, and Duke in a misleading score. This is a very close game for the first 37 minutes. We can talk about Battier, what Williams did, but it's the crunch time. My guy to sign. Allen Enforcer, Dunleavy. He got a key rebound, got that offensive tip, hit a big rebound, and scored off it. And now The Aggies committed five turnovers, and Jim O'Brien said after the game they were the better team. Well, against UCLA today, Utah State, the 12 seed, was not the better team. Bruins' Jason Capono did not start. He missed a study hall, so he had to sit in the bench. Utah State had the lead, but keep an eye on the uh, the clock there with the arrow and count the misses if you want to at all. Oh, Brick City! Yeah, this is, oh, this it was is Brick it. City, baby! Build some condominiums! This goes on for about 13-plus minutes. They don't score a field goal. Utah State missed 21, 21 straight shots. We'll say 21 consecutive shots. 21! Shoot 18% in the first half. It's stuck on Nine. That's it's just stuck there. <laughs> We're yeah, not that's trying. It. You missed the kid. I didn't. We're not trying to make oh. fun of my. Oh, but, but uh, this this shows you the fertility. They got some good looks in there. UCLA played some nice defense, but the Aggies got some good looks. Couldn't knock anything down. But look at the clock there. UCLA is not exactly pulling away either. Their team has not, but they do pull away later. And when you take a look at what happens, it yeah. finally is done. Give me one, please. Not even Bernard Rock, their all-conference point guard. We did not like what the Rock was cooking today. Yeah, the Rock was going up. It was Brick City. Could not find the basket, baby. Look at him. Stu Morrill had a great year this year, though. And I tell you one thing. This is a good basketball team that UCLA beat. Thorson, the seven-footer, missing the hook. Rock will miss the layup right here. Frustration, baby. Frustration. Brown misses a couple. But still, this is only a 10-point game with five minutes to play in the first half. UCLA not scoring yet. The Aggies, at least, were playing good defense despite their struggles. They were actually in this game, but eventually, Morrill's team would uh, fall victim to Jason Capono's threes. Nice feed inside here. Then they throw it back to Gadzurk, who really has played with a lot of energy in the first two games of this tournament. Well, Gadzurk yeah. just really ripped them up in a paint tick. I thought what he did on the boards, 14 rebounds, 16 points, 7 for 9 to field. Capono shooting 5 out of 7 on those threes. His close friend Al Skinner, both guards in the NBA at the same time and really the best of friends in coaching. BC, of course, the Big East regular season and tournament champs. And USC, an extremely talented team that oftentimes this year underachieved, but is a very dangerous tournament team because of athletes like Jeff Trapania right there with the follow dunk. Off the miss, Brian Scalabrini. This guy's one of the premier dunkers in the league in the world, Trapania. Crazy hops. USC up four at the half. Troy Bell gets the pass. Foul by Granville. It was Granville's fifth foul. He was sent out. So without the point guard, the press of BC caused the Trojans all kinds of problems. Robert Hutchinson coughs it up. Ryan Sidney lays it in. It's a three-point game in the final six minutes. After that, a 10-second violation. USC without Granville in deep trouble here. Sydney, perhaps dancing a little too soon. <laughs> Kenny Harley would grab the offensive rebound, lays it in. It's a one-point game, five and a half to play. Still, BC down one. Bell 
Look at the shake and move there. Little up and under layup. BC takes the lead. It's a three point USC lead, though. Bell misses a tough shot. The outlet to Sam Clancy. So many times USC went deep for the dunk over the press. Three or, four, yep. three or four of those long bombs like a quarterback on the end zone got it done. But watch here. There's the shot by Bell. The big three pointer cuts the lead to two. Then Kenny Harley down three in the final seconds what is he thinking? for some what is he reason thinking? takes it to the rack. What is he thinking? You can see the reaction of the bench here. They needed a three to try to force overtime. Harley perhaps didn't realize that. Bell went for the follow dunk instead of trying to tip it out to a shooter. And USC advances 74-71. Hutchinson, a 57% free throw shooter, the guy who came off the bench, Granville fouled out. Uh, Alford getting by the first round game against Creighton, obviously the underdog against the Kentucky team that has just been on a roll, but it had to survive a tough battle itself in the first round against Holy Cross. Only did so because Tayshawn Prince was so brilliant in the final minutes. As we showed you earlier, he was brilliant again tonight. For Iowa, Reggie Evans, nice drive in the bucket. Iowa would take the quick six point lead. Later in the first half, Evans, fake, draws contact, doesn't get the call, but does hit the shot. Evans, a strong game, 18 points and 13 rebounds. The but the backcourt for Kentucky, though, would come alive here. Well, I'll tell you, they had a great backcourt play. Mr. Bogans, Mr. Prince, Saul Smith played a solid game. I tell you, Kentucky's people from the perimeter, when they're making threes, they're tough to beat. Even Marquis Estelle stepped outside and knocked down a three. Here's Dean Oliver draining his own three, one and a second. Oliver had 26 points. Later, Prince, though, beating Estelle down low for the jam. Kentucky has a nine-point lead. We haven't really seen Prince score yet. Let's cue the Prince scoring plays. Knocking down the triple show in the NBA game that he's got. That's a deep three. And he can shoot threes from all over the place. He goes back to the same spot, though. You can see the Wildcats beginning to pull away. Double figure knee. Now, no look feed from Prince to Estelle for the dunk, who had 22. He, when he's chipping in 22, they're tough. And then Prince, one more time, and really deep wow. three. I'll tell you one thing. If you saw his game earlier this year when they were three and five, it was Struggle City. He couldn't make a shot. He has become an absolute superstar, a PT peer, Tayshawn Prince. You can talk about Keith and Bogans and uh, Keith Bogans. Bogans and Prince today, but the point I want to bring out is the bench, 27 to 12 bench points for Kentucky. So round two, that meant Lefty Drizel going back and taking on Maryland, a place that he was head coach for 17 years. And one breath at a press conference, Lefty said, they're the enemies, I'm going to war. And the next breath he's saying, ah, it's just a basketball game, you guys hype it up too much. Well, <laughs> Lefty wanted to beat Maryland badly. This would have been a disaster for Williams not to beat him. Shenard Long, the Georgetown transfer was huge. Knocks down the three and Georgia State had the early lead. And Terrence Morris, the big block. So Juan Dixon to Baxter. Morris and Baxter, total non-factors in round one. They were huge forces tonight. Baxter ties the game in the early going. Then Juan Dixon, Dick. I'll tell you, Juan Dixon, sensational player. There he is with the offensive rebound. Super quick. He's explosive. I tell you, when he's playing well, they are tough to beat. And there's the steal. Dixon sprints, gets the lay-in, the three-point play, and Maryland pulled away by seven. Chernard Long, though, in the first half, trying to keep Maryland, uh, Georgia State in. Long comes back, hits a big three. They're now down two. Georgia State hanging in. Here comes Kevin Morris. He gets back down the court. Easy basket. 35-33 at this point. Georgia State hanging in against the Terps. The Yellow Jackets transfer, hooking up with the Hoya transfer, but then Terrence Morris. They had so many easy baskets for the big guys. Dunks and layups inside. They really went to the inside, went to the interior, and the interior people dominated. Danny Miller, some big contributions with the feed from Blake right there. A 16-2 Maryland run in the second half. Long was really kept in check in the second half. Maryland did a good job defensively. Hits the circus shot here, but... At this point, it was a 12-point game, and it was just left to Morris and Baxter, the big guys down low, to finish off Georgia State. Yeah, what was interesting, it was tied at 47 apiece with 14 left, but it was Morris, Baxter, and Dixon who combined for 47, so that lucky number 47, that was the difference in the game. The Hoyas here, Steve Murfeld and the Pirates looking to continue the true Cinderella run of this tournament. And Carvis Williams is a future NBA center with the punch down there. Hampton in the game in the early going. He blocks the shot there. Georgetown gets it back, misses the three, and Hampton will push. Marseille Brown will lob it to Cleveland Davis, who's running the floor. Hampton showing something early, but Georgetown would pull away later in the first half. Kevin Braswell 
Dribbles. Kind of pushes the defender off. That's a little biggie's move and knocks down the shot. Hoyas began to pull away. Well, Braswell had a big day. He was sensational. He really was the spark. He set the tone. Scruggs hits that shot. Then Braswell again with a three. And the Hoyas in the first half building a 13-point lead. Yeah, it was 18-18 tied. And the Hoyas make the big run 24-4 to four to end the halftime. And that was the difference. They just blew it out in the second half. Georgetown with a 15-point second half lead. Burton, who was the hero the other night, just beating the buzzer. <laughs> Arkansas gets that shot, swatted away. Eight blocks for Tarvis Williams. This was a showcase game for his skills against a, a quality front line. You can see the big hug from his coach. That guy's going to make some money someday coming out of Hampton into the NBA. Yeah, he really is a solid player. Hey, remember Rick Mahorn's from that school. But, Rick, you haven't donated any money. Rick, run a check out. Help your alma mater. They just beat him up on the boards, 51-27. Uh -huh. No contest there. Now Georgetown making a statement. By State and since he hasn't played in 10 years, and Bob Huggins hasn't won a second-round game in four years. That's the guy you got to stop when you play Kent State. Trevor Huffman averaging 17 a game, but he would have major shooting problems, and that would spell problems for the Golden Flashes. Huffman can't get it going against the Bearcat defense. Obviously, Gear would stop him. They did a great job containing Huffman. They shut him down big time. He had 24 in that win over Indiana, but in this game, Bobby Huggins' club did a phenomenal job defensively. 23% shooting for Kent in the first half. You see on the putback right there, that's Jamal Davis. And the Bearcat front line has been oft criticized this year as being non-factors, not great rebounders, don't give a lot of scoring. They took that to heart today. Emmanuel McElroy, the alley-oop, Satterfield on the feed. He had seven assists. And then Steve Logan, you know he's going to provide offense. Cincinnati beginning to pull away in the first half. Leonard Stokes, one of those guys who's been kind of up and down this year with a punch down. I'll tell you one thing, their rebounding was sensational. They had a two to one edge, 42 to 21. And when they're rebounding, I'm telling you, Digger, they're tough to beat. There's Davis with the jumper, and then Donald Little gets the alley oop. Yes, yes, Donald Little in the paint, points in the paint. I love his game. A complete attack once he gets involved with the offense because of what Satterfield and Logan do in the perimeter. Cincinnati holds the Golden Flash to 43 points and a 23 point victory. They shoot 27%. That's a season low for Kent State. Huffman held a seven points, his second lowest total of the year. And the bench for Cincy is big, chipping in 19 points. This has not been a very good rebounding team all season long, though, Digger. But you point out against, against the Max, it right. can be fair, it's not a very physical front yeah, line. I, I don't know if they're going to be able to rebound like that against, say, a Stanford team. But the fact is this, their defense was solid. The other important factor was when you look at, when you rebound the way they did, they get the easy points and fast breaks. I don't know if they can play a half scoring game yet with Satterfield and Logan. And that's going to be the issue when they face Stanford because that's where Stanford will play you and really buckle down and get you in those negative situations to force shots. BYU and Kent State were the two opponents you saw on that graphic. Now they face a much more imposing offensive team. Well, there's no question. When you talk about Stanford, you're talking about that balance inside. For example, today, you talk about the Collins guys. They had 37 points between them. Jason with 22 and his brother, Jaron, with 15. And then you got to worry about the perimeter game. Casey Jacobson had a big game as well. But I think the job that he has done, Bobby Huggins, with this club has really been special. This is not a vintage team in terms of personnel when you look at the Cincinnati team. And for them to have 20 25 wins going to the Sweet 16. I give the guy an A+. Plus. 17 turnovers really hurt Cincinnati. You can't do that against a Stanford team. That's why they only had 66 points. And as many rebounds they had, they were neutralized with the turnovers. But we said he's very relieved. Kind of ironic, this Cincinnati team, which has been criticized, <laughs> is the one to snap that losing streak in the second round. But they do get a handful in the next round because Stanford is there. And Stanford had to survive a tough battle against St. Joseph's tonight. You take on St. Joseph's, you got to take on the streaky Marvin O'Connor, and Martelli turned his guys loose after falling behind. Jacobson knocks down the triple. Cardinal would build that lead in the early going. Ball movement, superb. Stanford will find Jason Collins here inside for the layup. This is a nine-point Stanford lead. They didn't look to you know, be in a lot of trouble at all in this game before O'Connor would begin to heat up. He can do this. We've talked about his 18 points in a minute. In the regular season finale, he would get it going here again. Well, he really did get it going. The guy had 37 points. He was sensational. One of the most underrated players in America. A lot of people don't know him. Marvin O'Connor, shoot the rock, baby. Tickle the twine. NBA, nothing but nylon. Michael McDonald answering for Stanford. He can shoot it as well. Michael can shoot the ball. His daddy played in the NBA with the Celtics. Glenn. Two-point game. O'Connor off the wing. This little fake. Knife's in. Gets the layup to go. Ties the game at 80. 
After two Mendez free throws, Stanford's up a pair. O'Connor shoots the three. This one would not go. It was kind of bothered by Jacobson over the top. Jason Collins gets fouled. Bill Phillips fouls out. Collins hits both free throws. Now it's a four-point game in the final 30 seconds, and Mendez with the steal to ice it. O'Connor fouling out with 37 points, but Stanford from the line was huge. 31 of 37 free throws, and in the final 45 seconds, they were 10 of 10. Well, you know, you're not 31 for 37, and St. Joe's is 15 for 20. I mean, what a margin right there. 16 points plus on the free throw line. I mean, they got the whole club.